Ahoy there! Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another episode of the Frigate Pilots Manifesto, the series that aims to... Wait, no, ha hang on, that's not right. Ahoy there, Captain Benzie here, coming at you with the first episode of the Destroyer Pilot Manifesto, the series that aims to teach you everything you need to know about becoming a better Destroyer Pilot in EVE Echoes. Yes, you guys have been asking about this for a long time, would I ever do this? Um, like I did the Frigate Pilot Manifesto, would I ever start to cover Destroyers? And the short answer is, well, here we go. Because simply put, I'm getting tired of every Destroyer video I put out, someone telling me in the comment section that Destroyers are utterly useless except for interdictors. And Whilst I'll be the first to admit the destroyers are not exactly where I would like them to be, there are definitely some buffs that they could go through, um, but that's another topic for another time, then destroyers are still not useless. There is plenty you can do with destroyers, and so time to set up a full series, examining them in deep detail, and going over what those kind of uses are, what destroyers are best, and all the kinds of crazy fun times that you can have with this class of ship. So here we are then with lesson one. We're going to be looking at what destroyers are, where do they fit into the grand scheme of things in Eve Echoes, and why on earth would you skill into flying them? We'll then have a basic overview of all 46 of the different destroyers in Eve Echoes, um, so do buckle up, That could be, this could get a little bit long. There are time, uh, timestamps in the description though if you do want to skip ahead. Before you skip ahead though, do be aware that there is a giveaway as well to celebrate the start of this series, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Before I do so though, if you enjoy this video, please let me know by hitting like on it, subscribe to the channel for all things Eve Echoes, ding that notification bell to never miss an upload, and let me know in the comment section down below what topics, what ships you want to see me cover in future videos. If you do want to go the extra mile to support this channel, we do first of all have a Patreon page. You can come and join me on there and learn more about my life out here in Africa, whilst at the same time we do then have a merchandise store now available on Redbubble. A lot of you have been asking for up close and personal t-shirts, we now have one. My amazingly talented wife came up with a really cool design that not only blends in the up close and personal but also the thrasher 2 as you see it here on screen now into a really cool t-shirt hoodie notepad all, all kinds of different merch do head and take a look at that Finally then, before we jump into this video, as I said, there is going to be a giveaway here to celebrate the start of the Destroyer Pilot Manifesto. I want you guys to come onto Discord and show me in the giveaway channel, which I'll set up at the end of this video, take a screenshot of your favourite Destroyer. Don't even need to tell me why it's your favourite destroyer, I just want to see some cool screenshots of some really cool destroyers. And at the end of the week, two of those will be picked to each win a month of Combo Omega. So do come and let me know which destroyer is your favourite. That said and done then, let's jump into the first episode of the Destroyer Pilots Manifesto. As you may expect from their placement in the ship tree, in Eve Echoes, destroyers fall part way between frigates and cruisers. On the one hand, they usually have a higher DPS output than frigates, mainly because they've got more high slots. More high slots means more guns and missiles, and more guns and missiles usually means you're capable of dishing out more damage. On the other hand though, you are usually slower and with a larger signature radius when flying a destroyer, which means you're almost as easy to hit as if you're flying a cruiser. Now, unlike cruisers, you have less native tank and a lower power grid, which means you're less likely to be able to fit medium-sized tanking modules. This means that destroyers may have higher DPS than frigates, but they're certainly a lot squishier than cruisers, which gives them kind of a glass cannon feel. Now, they're very good for running tier 1 through 7, combat anomalies and encounters. That's not to say that you can't do tech 8 plus content in a destroyer, certainly with the right destroyer, with the right skills and a good enough pilot, it is possible, but for the average player, you'll find that cruisers are usually better once you hit tech level 8. For tech level 1 through 7, however, destroyers are cheaper, both in the cost of the hull and the modules that you use to fit them, in so much as small cannons tend to be cheaper than medium cannons, for example, but also because the skills are cheaper. You'll often have some of the skills already trained from when you were flying frigates, things like, again, small cannons and small missiles will transfer from frigates to destroyers, plus the skills themselves are cheaper both in ISK and skill points. Destroyer Engineering 5 is cheaper both in ISK and skill points points than going all the way up to Cruiser Engineering 5, just the way it is. 
This means that destroyers form an excellent stepping stone without reskilling um, before hitting cruisers. Ultimately, it's extra variety to a frigate pilot and an excellent way for an alpha pilot to get the most out of the skills that they have. Once you start hitting about tech level 7, tech level 8, you may decide that a basic Omega subscription is your thing, at which point then, yes, it may be worth investing in some plex to reskill and looking into flying cruisers. Now, whilst we're talking about destroyers, however, it's worth noting that there are a couple of different types of destroyers. As you're looking here on the screen now, you'll have seen that there are a lot of the same hull. Ultimately, with frigates, there are 32 different types of frigates in the game, um, with a lot of variety between the hull. There are actually 11 destroyers per empire, which gives you 44 options. That's more than the frigates, but there is less variety in the hull size. For Kaldari, as an example, in frigates, you have the Merlin, the Heron, the Kestrel, the Condor, the Bat Phantom and the Griffin, whereas in Destroyers, everything is either a variant of the Cormorant or the Corax. Now, this is where I'd like to talk about mainline destroyers and secondary line destroyers. Now, the mainline destroyers tend to be the turrets of a particular weapon system. So, for example, with the Kaldari, that's the Cormorant using railguns, whereas the secondary line uses that, that nation's secondary weapon system, like, uh, again, missiles for the Kaldari in the form of the Corax, or using drones in the form of the Galente for the Algos. This is just terminology I want to get sorted at this point in time because I am going to use mainline and secondary line a lot as we go on in this video. But why on earth would you fly destroyers then? I've talked about the fact that they're cheap um, and make excellent runners for Tech 1 through Tech 7, um, but if you're given the option of going cruisers or destroyers, why might you want to go destroyers? Well, ultimately, it's combat utility. Destroyers not only have their basic DPS versions, but also have interdictors, guardians, and hopefully, if I'm reading things right, command variants. Now, interdictors are, of course, those destroyers that can put out those terribly scary interdiction sphere bubbles that plague Nullsec, make for excellent gate camping and PvP. They are terrifying in PvP if you're out in Nullsec. Interdictors are ultimately only found on uh, destroyers and on, uh, on cruisers, and the destroyers are able to drop their interdictor sphere and then move away to safety, whereas the, uh, the, the, the cruisers form a center of that sphere and are thus right in the thick of things at all times. You then also get the Guardian versions of the ships which can use the shield field module or the armor link module and are an excellent way to help support your fleet um, around you and if we get the command ship those again are excellent destroyers for providing a bonus and a buff to the rest of the fleet around them this means that destroyers are excellent for flying in wolf packs both for pvp and pve they're cheap enough to be disposable but variable enough that you can do a lot of really cool stuff with them now before we jump into the actual ship trees and start having a look at individual destroyers, I thought it'd be worth pausing briefly and just examining some of the key skills that you're going to want to train in order to be a destroyer pilot. Obviously I'm not going to talk about every blasted skill possible that you may ever want to train as a destroyer, just the key ones that are most important. So starting on the left here with cruising technology, of course we have the ever important destroyer command. This is probably your single most important skill to train as a destroyer pilot. Now, when you actually look at the skill itself, you'll see that it gives a 25% increase to destroyer velocity and a 25% reduction to inertia modifier. Now, the increase in flight velocity obviously means that your destroyers move quicker, whereas the reduction to the inertia modifier means they accelerate faster, they decelerate faster, they turn to align to a new target quicker, and that, of course, means they are capable of holding a sharper orbit. That in and of itself is useful, but it's not overly exciting. The reason that destroyer command is such a vital Vital skill is because of the ship bonuses. In fact, if we jump into a ship tree, I'm just showcasing it here on the Minmatar ship tree. If we have a look at the Thrasher, Destroyer Command bonus, there it is, plus 5% flight velocity. If we go to the Tal War, Destroyer Command bonus, reduction to warp drive signature radius penalty, stasis web of fire optimal range. Heck, up to tech level 5, Thrasher fleet issue, still getting Destroyer Command bonuses. And that's just the Minmatar tree. Obviously, if we head across to the Amar tree, you'll find the same thing across the board with their destroyers. In fact, every destroyer in EVE Echoes up to tech level 5 gets bonuses from destroyer command. And once you hit tech level 6, well, all it does is swaps a, a destroyer command for advanced destroyer command bonus. 
What that ultimately means is getting Destroyer Command to level 5 is probably the first thing that you should do as a Destroyer Pilot. Don't worry about going into Advanced Destroyer Command just yet, that is a skill that you will want to have trained by about the time you hit Tech Level 6. At Tech Level 6, a lot of your ships are going to start benefiting from having skills in Advanced Destroyer Command, but just take the basic up to 5 as soon as possible and only focus on Advanced Destroyer Command when Tech 6 is either looming or has just arrived. Obviously under navigation, afterburner and micro warp drive are going to be useful, but they're not exactly key skills. Same goes for shield operation and armor operation and all the different versions therein, things like armor hardening, shield hardening, etc. The one I do want to showcase, however, is defense upgrade. Now, Destroyer Defense Upgrade, what this does is having this at level 5 increases all of the shields, armor, and structure of every single one of your destroyers by 250 hit points apiece. It just means that your destroyers are going to be that little bit tankier. And considering that destroyers, as I mentioned, are pretty fragile as, it's, you know, as it stands as basic, and they're a little bit smaller, uh, sorry, a little bit like you know slower and larger than uh, the frigates, does mean they are going to take a bit more incidental damage than perhaps a frigate would. A Additional defense is always going to be nice, and once you start looking at advanced destroyer defense upgrade, and indeed expert destroyer defense upgrade, what you're looking at there is then percentage based, which of course scales indefinitely with the size of the ship. 25% of a small amount is, you know, a small amount of boost, 25% extra of a big amount of shield armor or whatever um, is obviously going to be a nice big amount there for defense. Now, beyond this as well, the engineering skill is going to be probably the most vital skill after Destroyer Command. Now, Destroyer Engineering itself, this gives you an increase to your capacitor's capacity, an increase to the amount of power grid that each of your destroyers have, and a reduction to the amount of capacitor required to activate your warp drive when you're jumping into or out of combat. Now, that last one's not particularly exciting. It's a nice quality of life that just means you tend to warp a little bit faster because you don't have to wait for your capacitor to recharge to a certain level, but it is mainly just quality of life. It's not overly exciting. The top two, however, are pretty vital. Capacitor capacity in itself is a very useful thing to have. Obviously, the bigger a ship's capacitor, the more stuff it can have active at any one time, and the faster, ultimately, gigajoules per second that it recharges. That helps you maintain capacitor stability across the board with all of your destroyers. But destroyer power grid, this is the vital aspect of destroyer engineering. The difference between a Mark III small strike cannon and a Gisti C-type small strike cannon isn't just the damage it does, but also the amount of power grid that it takes up. The more, uh, the more, the, the higher level modules um, also have a higher amount of power grid consumption. If you want to be fitting your ships out with the top level gear, they are going to need a bigger power grid. And if you haven't increased destroyer engineering skills, you will not be able to put top level gear onto your destroyers. That is just a fact. You can buy a top tier destroyer and not be able to fit all the stuff you want onto it simply because you do not have enough power grid because you are lacking in destroyer engineering skills. Again, after you have destroyer command to five, I would get destroyer engineering to five. And when you move into advanced destroyer command, that's when you probably want to start looking into advanced destroyer engineering, just because that allows you to keep up with what's going on. It's worth noting as well that once we get into expert destroyer engineering, you also get this reduction to the power grid requirements for small turrets and small missile and torpedoes. This is kind of a stacking effect. It means that not only do you have more power grid with which to fit things in, your weapons also use less power grid. Now that is vital, especially if, for example, you're using something like a thrasher and you're using strike cannons, some of those more power grid, like heavy modules. There are some modules out there that use a lot more power grid than others. And heck, if you've got these skills high enough, it does mean that you can sometimes start to use oversized modules, like using medium shield boosters, or heck, even medium neutralizers for extra PvP fun times. Now, it's worth noting as well that that small turret power grid need and small missile torpedo power grid need, that stacks onto any hull type. That is a reduction to the turrets, and it is not related to the hull that you're fitting it on. Which means if, like me, you happen to have expert frigate engineering trained all the way up to level 5, you've got the small turret power grid need reduction there, 
and small missile torpedo power grid reduction also 10% on each of those if you have expert frigate engineering up that means that your small missiles your small turrets etc require less power grid when they are being fitted to your destroyers and I showcase this in the thrash fleet issue video if you don't believe me you can check out the evidence there now I'm not suggesting that if you're a destroyer pilot you train all the way up to expert frigate engineering but if like me you're using destroyers as a nice alternative to your frigates it means that your skills do actually benefit each other which is always a nice thing to have it's worth mentioning if we pause pause briefly here on uh, target management target management is not overly a vital skill for a destroyer pilot once you have target management basic up to five that's pretty much all you need if you take advanced target management into uh, just literally skill one of advanced target management that gives you the full seven lock on targets and um, that the i think the most a destroyer can lock onto is seven so at that point you do have the most capability of locking on the only bit of benefit you're getting after that is the increase to scan resolution which, you know, in fairness, destroyers lock on fairly quickly as it is. Beyond this, finally, of course, you would then train in between um, after Destroyer Command and Destroyer Engineering before you start training to Advanced Destroyer Command and Advanced Engineering, because of course you're going to need to spend some skill points um, in order to hit Tech Level 6. Pick your weapon system of choice. If, like me, you've gone for thrashes and things like that, then small cannon operation and small cannon upgrade are going to be your shindig, whereas railguns for the cormorant and the, uh, the catalyst lasers for the coercer missiles for the corax and the talwa and for drones that's if you want to be flying dragoons or algos and have a look through these these do all kind of work the same cannon uh, operation gives you an increased damage and an increased tracking speed where a small uh, where a small upgrade gives you a slightly smaller increase to damage but increases the range of your weapon so kind of tweak that to which weapon system you want to be using most if you're using strike cannons rifled railguns beam lasers that kind of thing you're probably going to want to get upgrade leveled up first if you're using the shorter range versions like auto cannons um, snub nose rail guns or pulse lasers then sm uh, the small operation skill is probably going to be the one you want to focus on to get that additional tracking speed at this point in the video, we are going to do an in-depth examination of the ship trees to have a look at every single destroyer in EVE Echoes. Obviously, that's 11 destroyers for each of the four main nations, giving us 44 different options, plus the Shan Yu to have a look at at the end. Now, I have put timestamps down in the description below so you can jump to the particular ship tree that you want to have a look at, but I do recommend having a look through the Kaldari State one first, as I am going to be examining the layout of the ship tree and where the different ships fall. The Amar, Minmatar, and Galente versions are going to be a lot faster we're not going to touch on the ships particularly much other than the notable ones that are well worth having a look at that said and done then let's jump into the Kaldari state ship tree now, Kaldari State Destroyers are noticeable for a couple of different reasons. First and foremost, they are absolutely the slowest destroyers in EVE Echoes. Some of these ships move so slow that they can actually be outrun by battlecruisers. Yes, it's that bad. But on the other side, they are shield tanks, and they are probably some of the most sturdy destroyers in the game as well. Not only are they very solid shield tanks to start with, they also get bonuses to the size of their shield tanks, and with how shield tanking works, this means that they are are incredibly solid ships and can be very difficult to remove. Certainly they're not going anywhere in a hurry and they aren't able to avoid incoming fire, but they are capable of absorbing a surprising amount of firepower. Now being Kaldari, the mainline turret destroyer is of course the Cormorant and it's going to be using railguns, whereas the secondary line using alternate weapons is going to be the Corax using missiles. Now I've mentioned as well that we are going to spend a bit more time here in the Kaldari state tech tree just because we're going to be talking about the different positions of the different destroyers and how those are of course across the board the same with the different empires. So all of the mainline turret destroyers start at tech level 3. For the Kaldari that is the Cormorant. And now what makes a mainline turret destroyer notable is that they all of them without fail have the same roll bonus, a 25% increase to the optimal range of the small turret of choice. Now with the Cormorant and the Catalyst that is of course railguns, with the Thrasher that's going to be cannons, and with the Coercer line that is going to be lasers, but across the board it's always a roll bonus, 25% optimal range to the small turret system that fits that particular ship tree. 
Now beyond this, the Cormorant then gets bonuses to small railgun operation, increases the amount of damage that your railguns do, and their optimal range. This to me suggests rifled railguns, because you get a good amount of additional optimal range out of that. 25% additional optimal range to a snub-nosed railgun isn't much, 25% additional optimal range to a rifled railgun is a considerable boost in distance. Then of course Destroyer Command, that ever important skill as I mentioned before, 5% additional shield, 25% larger shields once you have Destroyer Command leveled up to 5. That makes these very tanky shield tanks. Once we move into tech level 4, the Cormorant can be upgraded to the Cormorant 2. The notable differences here are that the Cormorant 2 has an additional high slot, we go from 3 slots up to 4, and we get both the combat and the engineering rigs that allow us to add a little bit more variety to the ship as well, alongside extra damage because we can fit things like collision accelerators and burst aerators. We've still got that same roll bonus, again it is a Cormorant, it is a mainline turret destroyer so it gets that same roll bonus, and as with the Cormorant we get bonuses from small railgun operation and from Destroyer Command. Destroyer Command is that same 5% additional shield, where Small Railgun Operation is giving us less Small Railgun damage per level, but do remember you're getting 4 turrets now rather than 3, so it is still a massive increase in overall DPS, plus you're getting an increase to tracking speed alongside the optimal range. The optimal range increase is bigger here on the Cormorant 2 than it was on the Cormorant, so you're getting longer range rifle railguns, plus you're getting better tracking, which just helps them apply their damage to the target better. You can go for snubs on these, I'm not going to say you can't, I just think the Cormorant works better when it's fitted with rifled. Once you hit tech level 5, we get a bit of variance here now in the mainline turret destroyers. On one hand, you get the naval issue version, or fleet issue if you're a Min Matar pilot. Here it's the Cormorant Navy issue. Same roll bonus as you know from a Cormorant. We still get the four high slots as before. We now go up to three mid slots, which gives us a bit more in the way of um, electronic warfare options, things like webs, Nosferatus, um, target painters guidance disruptors, that kind of thing. Still only three low slots though, so still quite fragile here. We do get that same small railgun optimal range boost, uh, boost there from the roll bonus. Small railgun operation is still our skill, but now you'll see even though we've got four turrets, we're back up to 5% small railgun damage, making for a massive increase in DPS over the Cormorant 2. Now we do lose the, uh, the small railgun tracking speed boost that the Cormorant 2 had, but we still keep that small railgun optimal range. The additional DPS is probably worth it, you might miss a few more of your shots, but when they do hit, they're doing a lot more damage. You're still getting that 5% shield from Destroyer Command, but you're now also getting an additional 5, 25% of full training scan resolution, which just means you're able to lock on that little bit faster with the Navy issue. The second option you get at tech level 5 is of course the Cormorant Guardian. This is where the first of the Guardian ships come in. You still have that same roll bonus as small railgun optimal range, but now you have the additional roll bonus for being a Guardian of the ability to fit shield field modules. Now I have done a video on the the Thrasher Guardian, and I've compared that to the Thrasher Fleet issue. Same here goes, of course, for the Cormorant Guardian and the Cormorant Fleet issue. Might be worth giving that video a check out if you're not sure what shield field modules are, what they do, why you might be interested in those, that kind of thing there. And if you're not sure which one to go for between the Cormorant Guardian and the Cormorant Navy issue, if you're playing solo, I'd probably go for the Navy issue. If you're playing in fleets, go for the Guardian. Um, ultimately, go for both. Try them. They're fairly cheap, easy to fit. Have a bit of fun with them. Now here you'll find that not only um, do we have that Destroyer Command bonus as we had before, this is now changed, still Destroyer Command, but rather than bigger shields, we're getting small railgun tracking speed and small railgun optimal range. Notice it's not the damage, the DPS does massively drop off here on the Cormorant Guardian. In fact, you're going pretty much back down to the, thra uh, the, uh, the Tech 3 Cormorant when you're flying a Cormorant Guardian in, in terms of DPS, but getting additional tracking speed and additional range. This time around, rather than the small weapon system skill, we have Destroyer Defense Upgrade giving an additional 4% shield resistance. So the shields are actually pretty big on this. I've, I've heard people say, hang on, how come the Guardians don't get that 5% increase to shields that they had before? It's because the shields are already fairly tanky. They actually get a good amount of armor and structure in there as well by the time you hit the Guardians. What you are instead getting now is that shield resistance increase, which just means you take less damage. Your shields don't need to be as big if they absorb more damage because they've got higher resistances. 
Now, after tech level 5, of course, we come to tech level 6. This is where our first interdictor comes in. Again, being a mainline turret destroyer, we have that roll bonus, 25% additional optimal range, but this time, being an interdictor, we also get the ability to fit interdiction sphere launches. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on the interdictors. Again, these are those ships that are the ones that are capable of dropping the warp bubbles, that will often catch you out in gate camps, that kind of thing. You're getting bonuses here to the size um, and the effectiveness of those interdiction spheres plus you're getting additional damage and optimal range from advanced destroyer command if you're looking to fly interdictors be aware that you are starting to train into advanced destroyer command once you hit tech level six but in this case ultimately the interdictors are mainly there for those interdiction sphere launches i've done a video on propulsion jamming and on how the interdictors work do give that a check out if interdictors are something you're interested in now once ultimately at this point you can continue up with the main lines both with the cormorant 2 interdictor which is basically the Cormorant Interdictor, but better, and we have the Cormorant Covert Ops, which again is kind of like the Cormorant Navy issue, but has the ability of fitting Covert Ops cloaking devices, and is a massive DPS increase, and a much smaller and faster ship to boot. But I'm not going to dwell on these too much, because they are tech level 9 and tech level 10, and thus for most players are still a long way off. Let's instead have a look at that secondary line of destroyers, which of course for the Kaldari is the Korax. Now the Korax Trainer is one of the first ships you may encounter. If you're doing the advanced tutorials and um, when you first start Eve Echoes, the Korax Trainer is one of the ships that you can actually claim as a reward from I think it's advanced tutorial 2 or 3, it's fairly early on. What this ultimately gives you here is a destroyer that has a very basic fitting profile, 3 high slots, 1 mid, 3 lows, but you do get the capability of putting rigs in there, both power grid, uh, combat rigs, and uh, engineering rigs. We have the roll bonus here for the Corax, which is a 25% increase to missile torpedo velocity. Again, no matter which Corax you're flying, it always gets that same roll bonus. Here, we also have small missile torpedo, gives you an additional uh, damage per level. And destroyer command, the ever important destroyer command, gives you an increase to the optimal range of stasis weather fires and increases the optimal range of energy Nosferatus. This means that these become excellent ships for PvP because you've got that extra range there on the Nosferatu, extra range on the webs and um, the Korax ultimately are pretty good PvP boats. If you like the trainer, if the trainer is a ship that you do enjoy, you might decide to upgrade to the standard Korax. Basically what you're getting here is an additional mid slot so you can actually start using a few more E-War modules, start utilizing those bonuses because of course you probably want a warp disruptor or a warp scrambler in there as well, plus you get increases to the skill bonuses. This time around it's 10% missile torpedo damage plus you get explosion velocity on there as well which means the Korax is better at hitting faster moving ships. Destroyer Command, still the same, extra web of fire optimal range, extra Nosferatu optimal range. Once you hit tech level 5, you have no secondary destroyer. They fall again at tech level 6 with the snipers. Now, snipers are interesting ships that have an activatable sniper mode that increases the range of your missiles at the expense of your movement speed, ultimately. You still get the same bonuses here of the roll bonus, missile torpedo velocity 25%. That is, of course, additional range in and of itself. Plus, we go up to 3 mid slots and 4 high slots. That four high slots is already a massive DPS increase. Even if you don't use the sniper mode for the Korax sniper, the Korax sniper is a massive upgrade over the standard Korax. Flat off, 33% uh, upgrade um, across the board there. You're going from, if, if all of your missiles were doing 10 DPS, you've gone from 30 DPS up to 40. Big, big increase there. Beyond this as well, Advanced Small Missile Torpedo Upgrade. We are at Tech Level 6, so it becomes Advanced Skills now, both Advanced Small Weapon and Advanced Destroyer Command. You're getting more uh, Missile Torpedo damage there, plus that same Explosion Velocity we had before, meaning you're better at hitting smaller ships. The optimal range of the Nosferatu and the Web of Fire have both increased from 5% per level to 7.5% per level. That means we've gone from 25% total to 37.5% total. Big, big increase there. Finally then, at tech level 7, we get the Assault version. Now, Assault Destroyers, are, uh, these are essentially much more aggressive ships. These have the capability, in addition to the usual roll bonus of that Missile Torpedo Velocity, you get an, inc uh, an increase of 5 seconds to damage control activation time. So these do work really nicely with damage control units. Remember, if you activate a damage control unit, you get a massive increase to your resistances for usually 13 seconds. Here on the Korax Assault, that lasts for 18 seconds, which is usually enough time for you to hit your target and get a serious amount of damage off on it before it can really start hitting you back. 
We're still at four high slots. We now have four low slots as well, which gives us that extra place to put in the damage control. Three of each of the rigs as well that adds a lot more versatility. The assault destroyers, in my opinion, are actually some of the most fun to use. And the Korax assault, it's not a bad ship at all. I do prefer the Talwar assault, but the Korax assault is arguably a better brawler, um, good at getting right up into your grill and hitting hard. This is actually one of the slower destroyers in the game, though. Again, we're getting that increase to damage and velocity with the increase to Webifier optimal range and Nosferatu optimal range as well. Now, if you do like the Korax line of ships, unfortunately, once you hit tech level 7, that is your lot. There are no more Koraxes after tech level 7. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are asking, hang on, didn't you mention Command Destroyers at one point, Benzi? Yes, I did. These were available originally, I can't remember if it was the open beta test or the final beta test, possibly both, where they were on the ship tree, and I'm sure they were tech level 6. They might be tech level 7. Heck, they may have even been moved to tech level 8 now. These were destroyers, mainline destroyers, like the Thrasher, the Cormorant, the Catalyst, and the Coercer, um, that had the capability to also fit Command Burst modules. Now, in EVE Online, a Command Burst module is a module that you can activate, and it gives a quick boost to the HP, either of armor or shields, So you can, and sometimes does other things as well. We don't know what those are going to be doing in EVE Echoes. I know a lot of you have asked, hang on, you've got access to Fulmination. Haven't you seen Command Burst modules on there? No. Command Burst modules do not exist in the game currently, not even on the Fulmination test server, at least that I've been able to spot. So no idea what those do or how they work. But anyway, that's the Kaldari State Destroyer Tree. We are going to spend less time looking at the others because we've already talked about where the positions are and that basic sort of theme amongst each of the different types. So let's blitz through the other trees. Galente Federation destroyers, like their Kaldari cousins, use railguns for their mainline turret destroyers, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. The Galente ships are still on the slower side as far as destroyers go, but they can outpace the Kaldari ships. They're also armor tanked instead of shield tanked, and the secondary line use drones rather than missiles. Now, the main line for the Galente is of course the Catalyst, whereas the secondary line is the Algos. So let's jump right in. I'm not going to spend too much time on these because they are so similar to the Kaldari ones, um, just with a few notable differences which I will point out. Now of course the main line starts off with the Catalyst at tech level 3, you have that roll bonus for it being a mainline turret destroyer, optimal range, 25% increase to the small turret system of choice, small railguns, because they're Galente, small railgun, optimal range 25%, in fact the rest of the ship is almost identical to the Cormorant, you get 6% small railgun damage and 5% small railgun accuracy fall off. So here you have swapped the optimal range on the Cormorant for accuracy fall off on the Catalyst. This means that rifled railguns are still an excellent choice, but actually snub-nosed railguns do come into their own here. Snub-nosed are normally a... I, I don't normally like the snub-nosed railguns all that much. Basically, they look excellent on paper because they're very high DPS, but their range is so short that it can often be hard to actually maintain the required optimal range. Um, you do tend to fall into accuracy fall off, which is a very aggressive accuracy fall off so you do lose dps very very quickly it's very rare that most ships will actually be capable of pulling off the dps that the fitting window shows with snub nosed the catalyst is probably an exception to that the catalyst line of destroyers you can get away with using snub nosed railguns quite comfortably and it's well worth doing just because the dps it can kick out is absolutely monstrous it's also worth noting that Destroyer Command obviously gives you a 5% increase to armor rather than a 5% increase to shield. Being Galente, it is an armor tanked ship. This, of course, carries across to the Catalyst too. Same roll bonus. Like with the Cormorant, we now get an additional high slot, so we go up to four high slots. We then also have the addition of rigs. Two combat rigs, two engineering rigs. We get that same reduction to the amount of small railgun damage that small railgun operation bonus gives, um, but of course that is because we've got the four turrets now rather than three. We get tracking speed, we get accuracy fall off, um, as we would with the Cormorant, but obviously swapping uh, optimal range for accuracy fall off on the Catalyst. The Catalyst 2 is actually definitely well worth using uh, snub nosed railguns because you get that additional bonus to the optimal range and the accuracy fall off, and the tracking speed here means that those small snub nosed railguns just stick to their target like glue and you are 100% capable of dishing out the damage that they would otherwise do. Catalyst is an absolute face melter of a destroyer is what I'm trying to say. Destroyer command still 5% armor increase. 
Once we hit tech level 5, we have the Navy issue and we have the Guardian. These are almost identical to the Cormorant, uh, Cormorant Navy issue and the Cormorant Guardian. Obviously, the difference here is that the Guardian has Armor Link module rather than Shield Field module. So instead of watching the Thrasher Guardian video, I'd recommend watching the Coercer Guardian video that I put out explaining how Armor Link modules work. Again, if you're using, if you're torn between the Guardian or the, uh, the Navy issue, the Navy issue is better for solo, uh, for solo PVE content, whereas the Guardian is going to be more about uh, working in a fleet. Now, once we hit tech level 4 as well, we do have access to the secondary line of destroyers for Galente, which is the Algos line. Now, the Algos is a, dis is a drone destroyer. We have three drone tubes um, on the Algos that can launch small drones, um, plus two high slots, which you can use pretty much any weapon system of your choice, one mid slot, three low slot, and then two of each of the rig types. Now, the roll bonus for the Algos line is a 12.5% increase to drone velocity. This is how fast your drones move move and thus how quickly they can go from target to target. Drones, drone velocity basically means that there is less downtime between killing target A and killing target B. It also means that they're able to hit faster moving targets that little bit better and they are themselves um, harder to destroy because they are faster moving and they're harder to hit. In addition to this, as you'll see, small drone operation gives you additional DPS to the drones, and destroyer command starts to increase the optimal range of both uh, warp disruptors and energy neutralizers. The Algos line of destroyers ultimately are pretty good for PvP. They are genuinely quite surprising. That additional warp disruptor optimal range can often catch an opponent off guard, and the extra range of an energy neutralizer means you can start flattening their capacitor nice and early on, makes, making for a very aggressive ship that does a surprising amount of damage. And of course, this goes up into the standard Algos. Similar uh, fritting profile across the board there. Same roll bonus there, 12.5% drone velocity. We now have a bigger increase to drone DPS and an increase to drone effective hit points as well, which means, again, your drones become more survivable. Still, warp disruptor optimal range and energy neutralizer optimal range remains the same. The next Algos is the Sniper, which comes in at tech level 6. Now, ultimately, I'll be completely frank, never activate the Sniper mode with uh, the, the, the Drone Destroyers. There is no point. Sniper mode is terrible on Drone Destroyers. The range bonus is pitiful, and the cost that it has um, otherwise to your ship's movement speed is just tragic. It really, really gimps your ship. Don't bother. Why would you go up to an Algos Sniper rather than a standard Algos? And of course, it is a massive 30% increase to drone DPS per level. 30% increase per level is 150% additional drone DPS once that's fully trained. Plus again, the Warp Disruptor and Energy Neutralizer goes from 5% up to 7.5%. 25% goes up to 37.5% at full training. That's a big, big difference. Now for the Galente, the Interdictor at tech level 6 is the Catalyst. It's very, very similar here to the, uh, the Cormorant Interdictor. Obviously with Accuracy Falloff instead of Optimal Range, what with it being a Catalyst rather than the Cormorant. But with that bonuses there to Propulsion Jamming, Interdiction Sphere Launcher Activation Time, and of course the ability to actually fit Interdiction Spheres. If you're interested in Interdictors, um, again, watch the video I've put out on uh, the Interdictor Destroyers already. I'm not going to go into any detail here on that. Once we hit tech level 7, we reach the final of the Algos line, the Algos Assault. This has the capability, in addition to its usual drone velocity roll bonus, of getting 5 seconds extra to its damage control activation time. Makes it surprisingly tanky, um, capable of taking a lot more damage than any of the other Algos is capable of, plus you get the 3 of each of the rig types as well now, which gives you additional damage or additional survivability, depending on how you rig it. It's extra versatility, still that whopping 30% additional drone DPS and 7.5% optimal range of the warp disruptor and the energy neutralizer. The Algos Assault is actually a pretty terrifying PvP ship. The damage that it can kick out with those drones is astonishing. The, uh, the extra range to the neutralizer and the warp disruptor can often catch an opponent off guard and allows you to utilize the extra range afforded by drones. Plus, on top of that, the, uh, that third rig slot in each side adds extra variety, extra damage, extra survivability, depending on how you choose to rig it. I love the Algos Assault. Excellent destroyer. Well worth having a look into. 
After that, however, again, it is tech level 9 and tech level 10. You get the Catalyst 2 Interdictor, which is just a direct upgrade over the Catalyst Interdictor, and the Catalyst Covert Ops, which can fit a Covert Ops cloaking device and otherwise get some pretty terrifying increases to the DPS um, applied by small railguns. Catalyst Covert Ops, I can't wait to fly one of these things. That is going to be an absolute beast with snub-nosed railguns. I <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that. Key point to note, though, whilst it can fit a Covert Ops cloaking device, it does not get the stealth bomber roll bonus that means it can lock on instantly when the cloak drops it cannot when the cloak drops there is still a few seconds before you can start locking onto a target the covert ops cloak is there to allow you to scout find your opponent and then come back without the cloak activated lock on and initiate combat excellent for scouting it's not there for ambushing the Amar Empire's destroyers share some key similarities with the Galente Federation. First and foremost, they are armor tanked, and they tend to use drones for the secondary line. Beyond this, however, though, the Amar ships are faster than the Galente, making them almost as fast as the Minmatar, and they use lasers for their mainline turret destroyer. Now, of course, those mainline turret destroyers start at tech level 3 with the Coercer, and like all of the other mainline turret destroyers, you get a roll bonus of a 25% increase to the optimal range of the small weapon system of choice. In this case, of course, that is lasers. Being a Mar, we are God-fearing laser monkeys. Now, small laser operation then gives us an increase to small laser damage and a reduction to the amount of capacitor required to operate those lasers. Destroyer Command then increases the armor of the ship. As I said, Amar ships tend to be armor tanked. Now, that right there is the blueprint for every Coercer going forward. Small laser optimal range by 25% as a roll bonus, um, additional small laser damage, additional small laser capacitor reduction, and armor increase. You'll find that all of them do that as we increase. And at tech level 4, of course, we go straight into the Coercer 2. Coercer 2 gets an additional high slot and the ability of fitting rigs. Two combat rigs, two engineering rigs, ex extra survivability, extra damage. Same roll bonus for being a Coercer, and we're still getting small laser damage and reduction to small laser capacitor need. Being the Coercer 2, we also get an increase to small laser tracking speed, which means that beam lasers and pulse lasers do both work really well here on the Coercer. I normally like using beam lasers myself, but pulse lasers are definitely a viable option on the Coercer 2 and make for an incredibly powerful PvP ship. Again, like its uh, earlier brother, the standard Coercer, destroy a command bonus, plus 5% armor, 25% additional armor at full training. Now the Coercer line then of course increases into tech level 5 with the Coercer Guardian. I've done a video dedicated to this explaining how armor, uh, armor link modules work. We go back down to 3 high slots but we gain a 4th low slot which makes these much much tankier. You can fit a lot of uh, additional tank in these uh, ships low slots. We're getting additional armor resistance here, notable because compared to the Catalyst Guardian, Catalyst Guardian gets an additional 5% armor like the other Catalysts do, whereas the Coercer Guardian goes to armor resistance which just means it takes less damage on its armor you uh, if someone's shooting you with a uh, with a particular weapon you absorb more of that weapon's damage so you just take less overall so there's less to repair the catalyst has a bigger tank um, and thus it's like having more armor that you've got to get through whereas the coercer line um, just reduces the amount of damage that you do actually take Otherwise, you still get that laser tracking speed and the laser capacitor need from Destroyer Command. And if we go across into the Coercer Navy issue, here we have that same roll bonus, optimal range, laser damage, laser tracking speed, and a reduction to laser capacitor need. In addition, Destroyer Command obviously gives us that 5% increased armor. And as with the other Navy issues, scan resolution comes into play as well. We have four high slots, three low slots, good damage output here from the Coercer Navy issue. This, in my opinion, is one of the best trainer pvp ships the sheer amount of damage that this can kick out with pulse lasers is terrifying it'll melt through a lot of surprisingly powerful ships i've seen coercer navy issues take down caracal uh, caracal navy issues um, and all kinds of stuff there with their lasers they just arrive they rip them apart and then they just head off into the sunset now, the secondary line of destroyers here for the Amar is the Dragoon line. Interesting looking hull. I quite like how the Dragoon looks, actually. It's a very unusual split hull design. Very blocky, very straightforward, but quite cool. These are drone destroyers, like the Algos drone destroyers. So they get that roll bonus of 12.5% increase to drone velocity. And of course, the Dragoon trainer, like the Algos trainer, the Corax trainer, and the Talwar trainer, um, is available as part of your advanced tutorials. You do get to 
choose one of these once you complete, I think it's Advanced Tutorial 3 or 2, it's fairly early on that you get that, it might even be 4 though in fairness, um, but it is fairly early on that you get access to these. What you're getting there in addition to that drone velocity is additional drone DPS, higher damage from your drones, energy Nosferatu optimal range, energy neutralizer optimal range, and an increase to small laser damage. Now it's notable that after the Dragoon Trainer you don't get small laser damage anymore on these hulls, you can fit whatever weapon system you like. It's quite common to see a Dragoon ship fitted with something like um, Snubnosed if it's going to go into a brawling build, or even missiles if it's going to utilize the extra range afforded to it by drones. And here we have the Dragoon itself, the basic mainline Dragoon, three drone tubes can launch small drones, two high slots that have no additional bonuses here uh, for any particular weapon type, so whatever weapon type you fancy putting in those high slots, you can go for. Two mid slots, three low slots, and two of each of the rig types. Nice versatile destroyer with an exceptional amount of DPS afforded to it thanks to the small drone operation skill. The Dragoon Trainer only gets 5% per level, the uh, uh, mainline Dragoon itself 20%. So that's an additional 100% drone damage if you have small drone operation bonus trained up to 5. That is literally doubling the DPS of your drones, which is just incredible. Extra Nosferatu optimal range, extra energy neutralizer optimal range means that this is useful both in PvE and PvP. You can have a better, more efficient running Nosferatu that is going to be applying even if you're a little bit further out. And if you're in PvP, you can swap that to a neutralizer and flatten your opponent's capacitor nice and quickly um, whilst at a range that they don't necessarily think that you're capable of doing that. Now, again, of course, we don't see the Dragoon come back until we hit tech level 6 with the Dragoon Sniper. Now, like the Algos Sniper, this is a drone sniper. Do not use Sniper Mode. Sniper Mode is a special, unique, activatable mode exclusive to sniper ships. If you activate it, you get a little bit of extra range on, on uh, the, the sniper drone ships. It's literally like an extra 10, 15 kilometers um, of drone control range. It's really not much. And in, re uh, in return, it locks your ship down to 1% of its movement speed so you are stuck there as a sitting duck while your drones get barely any additional range. So why might you go from the Dragoon up to the Dragoon Sniper? After all it's the same fitting profile right, same amount of slots there, same roll bonus, but advanced small drone upgrade is now giving you a 30% increase to drone DPS rather than 20%. That means full training has gone from 100% DPS to 150%. That is a massive increase on DPS from your drones makes the Dragoon, uh, Dragoon Sniper a straight-up upgrade. That's before we even look at the Energy Nosferatu and Energy Neutralizer optimal ranges, which have increased from 5% per level, 25% at full training, to 7.5% per level at 37.5% uh, at full training. That's an additional 12.5% range um, at full training. Very, very nice. There are actually other bonuses, um, like with its speed and its uh, signature radius once it goes to Sniper, but again, we're not going to go into that, or this video is going to be three hours long. The Dragoon Assault then rounds off the Dragoon line of destroyers. Our secondary line ends here in the Amar ship tree. Dragoon Assault, again, I love this ship to pieces. This is surprisingly good fun to use. Being a Dragoon, it gets that drone velocity roll bonus. Being an Assault ship, it gets an additional 5 seconds to any dra damage control unit that it has active. This, of course, means rather than 13 seconds of massively increased resistances, you are getting 18 seconds from the Dragoon Assault. Otherwise, it is very much the same as the Dragoon Sniper, 30% drone DPS, 5% drone velocity, and 7.5% Nosferatu optimal range, 7.5% neutralized optimal range. It is, other than the actual stats here, like its movement speed and that, the Dragoon Assault and the Dragoon Sniper are fairly similar other than that activation time. The Dragoon Assault is still definitely worth it over the Sniper in my opinion, but try out the Sniper first, then upgrade to the Assault with time. Again, beyond that, once you start hitting tech level 9 and tech level 10, you do have the last of the mainline turret destroyers with the Coercer 2 Interdictor, which is of course a direct upgrade over the standard Coercer Interdictor, and the Coercer Covert Ops. This is basically a Coercer Navy issue on steroids with the ability to fit a Covert Ops cloaking device. You get some rather insane damage boosts from this. You have three of each of the rig types, um, plus a much smaller signature radius and an increased flight velocity over the Navy issue. 
Also, it is worth mentioning that the Covert Ops cloaking device does still have that, uh, that lock delay. If you fly up to someone, drop your cloak, and try to lock on, there is still a delay between dropping the cloak and locking on. This is not a stealth bomber, it is not designed for ambushing, it is designed for scouting out a target, then coming back. Literally go into an anomaly, spot your targets there, figure out where they are, then go back out of the anomaly, drop the cloak, and jump right in on top of them, rip them apart, and fly off to safety. If someone else turns up, you can warp away, and you can activate the Covert Ops cloaking device whilst mid-warp, which means when you land at your target destination, you are going to be cloaked, which is very useful if you're running away and being chased to a planet or something like that. You don't want a load of people to drop in on you um, at your destination. The destroyers of the Minmatar Republic are the smallest and fastest destroyers in EVE Echoes. Like the Kaldari State Destroyers, they are shield tanked, though not nearly as effectively as the Kaldari ones are. Also like the Kaldari, the secondary line use missiles, in this case that is of course the Talwar line of destroyers. Now the mainline turret destroyers for the Minmatar Republic are of course the Thrasher line, and these use cannons. You can see here the typical roll bonus of a mainline turret destroyer, 25% increase to the optimal range of the small turret system of choice, in this case cannons. Now I love the Thrasher. The Thrasher line of destroyers is probably my favourite in the game, and honestly for me worth training destroyers just to be able to fly the Thrasher line. I've gone into great lengths as to why I love the Thrasher in other videos, I'm not going to spend too much time waxing lyrical about them here. Now, the Thrasher at Tech Level 3, of course, sets the blueprint for other Thrashers going forward. Small Cannon Operation is the main skill, increases the Small Cannon Damage by 7.5%. Destroyer Command increases the Flight Velocity, leaning into that bonus of extra, ta uh, extra Cannon Damage, plus the extra Flight Velocity, again, makes the Thrasher one of the fastest moving destroyers. Its basic Flight Velocity is faster than any of the other Tech 3 destroyers, and then it gets Flight Velocity bonuses from Destroyer Command, and as I said, that sets the blueprint for all thrashers going forward, like the Thrasher 2. We get that additional high slot and the two rigs of each type. We do drop down from the 7.5% uh, small cannon damage down to 4% small cannon damage, but then again that's because we've gone from 3 turrets up to 4, and we get small cannon tracking speed added in here as well. Now the Thrasher 2 is an absolute beast of a destroyer. Fit this thing with uh, small auto cannons and just watch it go. It can easily clear tech 7 encounters and anomalies, um, and you'll have a great time with this. In fact, we use a lot of these in PvP. Um, fleets of Thrasher 2s can just be terrifying in how effective they can be. Again, Destroyer Command gives that increase of 5% to the flight velocity, making the Thrasher 2 a very nimble, very quick moving ship. Once we hit tech level 5, the Thrasher line becomes the Thrasher Guardian. Again, we lose the high slot, um, going down to 3 high slots, gain a low slot instead, going up to 4, and we gain the ability to fit shield field modules. I've done the Thrasher Guardian twice now in different videos, well worth checking out those um, to understand how shield field modules work, and whether or not you want to use a Thrasher Guardian over a Thrasher uh, fleet issue, as we'll see in a moment. Destroyer Defense Upgrade increases the size of the shield, and Destroyer Command then increases both the tracking speed and the damage, of small cannons. Again, it's not particularly much, but it's something, and it helps out on the Guardians. The fleet issue, otherwise known as the Navy issue for every other of the four empires, uh, the Thrasher fleet issue, again, it's back up to four high slots, three low slots, two of each of the rig types, we still have that small cannon optimal range, we now get a, uh, the tracking speed back in and additional small cannon damage, we go from 4% back up to 7.5%, that is a big increase in DPS overall, and on top of Destroyer Command giving us 5% shield per level, we're also getting that scan resolution for faster locking. At tech level 4, we have the Talwar line of destroyers, which of course starts with the Talwar Trainer, which you can get through the advanced tutorial program when you first start out as a new pilot. Three high slots, one mid slot, three low slot, can't really go wrong with fitting this thing as long as you're putting missiles on it. Two rigs of each type as well, add a little bit of extra variety there. Now, like the Korax line of destroyers, the Talwar has a roll bonus of 25% missile torpedo velocity. That isn't just how fast the torpedoes reach their target, it also increases the range of those missiles and torpedoes as well, meaning you can strike from further away. 
Talwar is honestly, in my opinion, the best of the secondary line destroyers, and actually the Talwar is right up there amongst some of the best destroyers in EVE Echoes, in my opinion. You get small missile torpedo operation, increasing the damage of those small missiles and torpedoes, and destroyer command increases the optimal range of your webifiers, increases small cannon damage, which to me is just a really ridiculous thing to have on this ship. It is definitely a missile ship, not a cannon uh, ship. I don't know why you would ever put cannons on one of these, but there we go. Notably though, 10% micro warp drive signature radius penalty. The Talwar line of destroyers can run micro warp drives without having its signature radius bloom brighter than a supernova, which means that they can actually run them almost as if they were afterburners without meaning they take supreme amounts of damage back. Well worth noting. The basic mainline Talwar, again, you get that additional mid-slot, goes up to two mid-slots, and we go uh, get a massive increase there to the amount of damage that your missiles do. 10% rather than the previous 6%, and again, we've got 10% signature radius penalty, 5% optimal range, and 6 on the damage, whereas the Talwar, well, actually has the same thing, but for some reason they have got rid of the cannon stat and increased the micro warp drive signature radius penalty to 15%. That means you're getting a 75% reduction to the bloom caused by a micro warp drive just means you don't blossom as nearly big um, as you would without it once you hit tech level six our mainline destroyer is the thrasher interdictor i've covered this one at length in other videos as well and um, basically it's a thrasher that can fit interdiction sphere launches and gets bonuses to how long those spheres stay in uh, in space you do get some small cannon damage on top there that brings it kind of in line with the fleet issue, but it falls apart compared to the fleet issue in every other way. It's not as tanky, it's not as fast, um, you're better off sticking with the fleet issue if it's for solo PvP, uh, solo PvP or PvE, whereas the Thrasher Interdictor is there for that, uh, for that gate camping capability. For the uh, tier 6 of the secondary line, we get the Talwar Sniper. Now again, sniper mode, you can activate this to uh, stop your movement speed all the way down to 1%, whilst increasing the range of your missiles. It's not a huge range increase, um, I am hoping that perhaps the sniper mode does get fixed um, in a future patch, there's a lot of buffs I'd like to see given to uh, various different destroyers, but I'd like to see the extra range given to the sniper, uh, sniper destroyers. Certainly, the Talwar does benefit from that quite nicely. You're uh, capable of missile kiting um, with that extra range. I've showcased that in videos as well. It is good fun. But even if you're not using the sniper mode, the Talwar sniper is a direct upgrade over the standard Talwar, just because you're getting more, uh, more slots to play with and you're getting bigger stat boosts there from the small missile torpedo damage. Overall, very, very nice ship. I do enjoy the Talwar sniper an awful lot, but... It is definitely the Talwar Assault that wins things out for me. I'm actually recording another video on the Talwar Assault at the moment. Um, this is my favorite of the Assault Destroyers. It's one of my favorite destroyers overall. This is an incredibly powerful ship, both thanks to the additional slots that it gets, the 5%, uh, 5 seconds extra damage control activation time, making it astonishingly tanky. The small missile torpedo damage is very nice. That ability to run a micro warp drive without having a huge signature radius is huge, and the the increase to the stasis webifier optimal range means you pose a very real threat to ships like daredevils and succubuses that otherwise try to stay out of stasis webifier range you have a longer range than they may expect and that can cause all manner of problems i adore the talwar assault this to me is one of the main reasons for training into destroyers the talwar assault and the thrasher line for me personally at least Speaking of the Thrasher line, once we hit tech level 9, the Thrasher Interdictor gets a direct upgrade with the Thrasher 2 Interdictor, and the Co uh, Thrasher Covert Ops arrives at tech level 10. This can kick out an astonishing amount of DPS thanks to that 18% per level increase in small cannon damage. It gets additional flight velocity, an even smaller signature radius, and it's already a tiny signature radius and a very high flight velocity. Excellent for speed tanking this ship. Plus, we get the ability to fit Covert Ops cloaking devices. It's notable that you do not have that stealth bomber bonus of removing the uh, cloaking not, uh, cloaking device uh, targeting delay. If you are in a Thrasher Covert Ops and you're cloaked in a cloaking device, if you drop that cloak, you do still have a period before you can lock onto a target. This is not an ambushing ship, it is a scouting ship. Jump into a situation, spot your opponent, get a measure of them whilst you have to cloak on, jump back out of the anomaly, turn around, drop the cloak, and jump back 
in. Or if you need to run away from like a, a, an enemy fleet that's catching you, again, you can activate the cloak whilst warping so that they can't see you when you land. You don't accidentally jump into an entire fleet and just get auto-locked and blapped. You've got a few moments there with a cloak up that you can just have some fun and escape nice and safely. Now, I would feel remiss for doing an introduction to destroyers without also talking about the Yan Zhong, which are Eve Echo's unique and exclusive faction. Now, normally the special factions in Eve give you a cruiser, a frigate, and a battleship. Here with the Yan Zhong, it is instead a battle cruiser and a destroyer. And actually, the first of these, the Shan Yue prototype, is given away free if you are in a mega pilot during your first month of login rewards. I think it's around about day 15 that you actually get the ship and all the fittings required um, to use it because it does use its own unique weapons. But let's have a look here at the prototype. You see, it's got a fairly rounded uh, damage fitting here um, for a destroyer three high slots, two mids, three lows, three of each of the rig types, three combat rigs, three engineering rigs, makes for a surprisingly versatile ship. It's also uh, notable that there are no bonuses to this ship in regards to skills. You can fly this if you are a manufacturing pilot or a miner or whatever. It doesn't matter. You don't need any form of combat skills to fly this effectively. Obviously, they do help it a little bit, but I don't recommend training small decomposer skills just for the Shan Yue prototype. That is something you want to look at for when you start flying the actual mainline ship itself, and we'll come to that in just a moment. But in regards to the prototype, what you do have is a roll bonus that increases the damage of the small decomposers by 75% and increases their range by 15%. Now, decomposers are also already fairly damaging, but they are quite short range and they don't have an accuracy fall off. You're either in optimal range or you're not in range at all. Ultimately, this makes them have a slightly longer range, and it turns their already solid damage into some quite frightening DPS, considering this is a free ship. And again, remember, you do get given some of the fittings for this as part of the daily login rewards as well. Certainly, it's not the most powerful ship out there. It is very fragile. It is the epitome of glass cannon, though it can fit a medium shield booster. Um, but you do also notably here get an increase of 15% shield from the ship itself and plus one warp stability, which means if someone comes in with a single warp, uh, warp disruptor, they're not going to be able to lock you down with just that one warp disruptor. They are going to need a scrambler or uh, multiple warp disruptors to help lock you down. It just gives you a nice little ship here that anyone can fly and help them do Tech 5, Tech 6 content nice and easily early on. And with the right skills, I have witnessed people clearing Tech 8 and Tech 9 encounters using the Shan Yue prototype. Now, beyond the prototype itself, you do have the Shan Yue Destroyer. Now, thanks to me flying on the Fulmination test server from time to time, I have actually had access to one of these, and I've been having an awful lot of fun flying this thing. Again, the fact that you've got a decent amount of slots there across the board, plus these really powerful roll bonuses, additional decomposer optimal range goes from 15% to 25% on the mainline Shan Yue. Plus, you go from 75% small decomposer damage up to 80% small decomposer damage, and you keep that plus one warp stability. Now, for advanced small decomposer upgrade, this is when you are flying one of these, this is when you may decide that actually the decomposer skills are worth training. I would not train decomposer skills otherwise, simply because no other ship benefits from them. And it's kind of, I feel like those SP could be better used elsewhere. But anyway, Advanced Small Decomposer Upgrade increases that Small Decomposer damage by a further 10% per level, up to a maximum of 50%, and increases that optimal range by another 5% per level, 25% across the board. Gives a big increase to the optimal range, and a big increase to those already solid Decomposer damaging. Brilliant ship, very, very powerful, kicks out an awful lot. Now, Advanced Destroyer Command bonus here, giving an additional 5% shield, and again, the uh, Shan Yue over the prototype all already has a bonus of having a considerably larger shield. The fact that it's then getting additional bonuses from Advanced Destroyer Command to its shield um, just helps it be even more tanky. And interestingly enough, it gets an increase to its warp speed. 50% additional warp speed on top of that 4.5 AU means you're going at, what, 22.25? Uh, so that's 6.75 AU? if you are uh, warping with this in null sec, and of course that then gets increased by 50% in low sec and 100% in high sec, which makes it an excellent ship for running encounters because you can get from A to B, system to system, very, very quickly. Now, I do intend to put a video out on the Shan Yue 
and soon I have been recording it and having a lot of fun with it. I do actually really enjoy this ship, it is pretty cool. No, we don't know how or when we're going to be able to get this on live. I'm only able to fly this thanks to me having access to Fulmination, but more information on that as we get it. And there we have it, an introduction to all things destroyers, why you might want to fly these, and how best to get started. Now, I really enjoy destroyers. Now, yeah, okay, they're not quite as versatile as frigates, and for me, frigates will always hold a special place in my heart, but destroyers hold a very close second, not least of all because, of course, they have access to the Talwar and the Thrasher line of ships, and you guys know how much I adore my Thrashers, Air Benzi all the way. Hopefully that's given you some inspiration as to why you might want to try destroyers, and hopefully some of the naysayers may go, actually, you know what, that does sound pretty fun, let's give it a go. They're cheap enough to skill into, just have a bit of fun with, you can kind of use them as a little bit of a side project if you don't want to skill into them deeply as your main ship type. For me, destroyers make an excellent secondary point to go into after frigates, mainly because they utilize a lot of the same skills, but for other players you'll find that destroyers are an excellent place to go and sort of get you all the way up to tech level 7 before you start real, uh, realigning your skills into things like cruisers. Anyway folks, let me know your thoughts and opinions on destroyers in the comments section below. Of course, check out that giveaway um, that I mentioned at the start of the video, and of course let me know what your favourite destroyer is in the comments section below, what you enjoy about them, what it is that you're looking forward to, and of course let me know which destroyers, which ships, etc, which topics you want me to cover in future content. Thanks for watching right the way to the end guys, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!